Hi, this is Andrew Wolf. In this video, I'm continuing my series on oncologic emergencies. In particular, I will be talking about hypercalcemia. Now, before we get into the pathophysiology of hypercalcemia, I need to talk a little bit about the physiology of calcium regulation in the body. In particular, I want to talk about the parathyroid gland and parathyroid hormone. In the body, um, you know, the parathyroid gland is very important in controlling the amount of calcium. Well, imagine that these little white dots represent calcium ions. And uh, the parathyroid gland helps to regulate the calcium ions within a carefully prescribed range, right? And that range is usually somewhere around 8.5 to 10 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so if the calcium levels decrease below this, um, then the par this will stimulate the parathyroid glands, which again, um, the parathyroid glands, for, uh, just to remind you about the anatomy, are actually four little glands um, spaced generally within the, uh, the lobes of the thyroid gland. So when the calcium levels fall below this sort of set range, then the parathyroid gland will be stimulated to release parathyroid hormone. And the parathyroid hormone will get distributed through the bloodstream to three different areas of the body, to the kidneys, and to the bones. And to the gut. Okay, now it'll exert its effect, effect in these three areas. So within the kidney, the parathyroid hormone will stimulate the, uh, the tubules in the nephron to increase reabsorption of calcium. Okay, so it's going to increase reabsorption of calcium. Now in the bones, it's actually pretty interesting to know, consider what happens in the bones because what happens in the bones is it actually stimulates the osteoblasts, little osteoblasts, to release a little chemical called rankle. And the rankle actually floats out of the osteoblast in, in response to the parathyroid hormone. Okay, so we've got the parathyroid hormone that stimulates a receptor here within the osteoblast to release rankle, and then rankle floats down to a nearby osteoclast, and that osteoclast is stimulated to begin to reproduce itself. It actually is an osteoclast precursor and it begins to make lots and lots of osteoclasts. Okay, so what do osteoclasts do? Well, they begin to break down bone tissue and that causes um, an increase, a release of stored calcium in the bone to be released into the bloodstream. So it increases calcium in the bloodstream. Okay, and then the third thing parathyroid hormone does is it stimulates the gut to increase absorption of calcium. Okay, so all three of these things working together will increase calcium levels in the blood. So in a normal functioning human, this uh, parathyroid hormone is going to be released in, in, um, in response to falling levels of calcium in the blood to try to keep it within this normal range. So logically you're, you would probably think that a you know you'd have to have a cancer of the parathyroid gland in order to have significant effects of hypercalcemia related to parathyroid gland. But what's interesting here is we can actually have tumor cells and the tumor cells that most commonly do this are breast cancer cells, um, small squamous cell, lung cancer cells, um, cholangiocarcinoma, and uh, multiple myeloma. And these malignant cells, genetics, mutations, 
and these genetic mutations are coding for aberrant proteins and one of the aberrant proteins that are being produced is something called parathyroid related protein and this parathyroid related protein is similar enough and has um, components on it that are able to bind with the parathyroid hormone receptors within the kidney, the bones, and the gut. So even though these are not parathyroid cells, they are rele releasing a polypeptide that is nearly identical or very similar to parathyroid hormone, and it's called parathyroid-related protein. And obviously, this is just being released in large quantities by a tumor, and it's not in response to calcium levels at all. So this is not an adaptive situation. Um, and what does parathyroid-related protein do? Well, it does the same thing. The, the receptors can't distinguish the source of the protein or the polypeptide. Um, it's causing the same effects that parathyroid hormone is. It's increasing... Uh, reabsorption of calcium. It's increasing the breakdown of bone and release of, of stored calcium into the serum, and it's increasing absorption of calcium from the gut. Okay, so this is all due to a uh, significant genetic mutation that is creating a polypeptide that is, um, that is mimicking parathyroid hormone. Now, it's curious, this actually ha occurs in an estimated about 10% of cancer patients, and I told you that which cancers it's most common in. And unfortunately, it's often recognized very late and it's very often mismanaged. So it's something that's very important to be aware of because it's relatively common and because it's often misdiagnosed and mismanaged. But because you're watching this video and educating yourself that uh, you won't have that problem. The um, most important thing to do is to consider looking at calcium levels periodically in your cancer patients, particularly if they have uh, breast cancer, cholangiocarcinoma, multiple myeloma, or squamous cell lung cancer. And then the other thing that's important is to recognize the common signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia, and that's what we'll talk about next. Okay, so signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia. The first that um, we should consider are signs and symptoms within the nervous system. And just to remind you, calcium plays a really cr critical role within the transmission of the action potential across the synaptic cleft. Now, how does it do that? Remember, the action potential is moving down the axon um, by transmission of the um, you know, through transmission of the action potential through uh, fast sodium channels. But when it gets down to the synapse, what happens is we have voltage-gated calcium channels. And the voltage-gated calcium channels, uh, um, when they are triggered by the action potential moving down the axon, allow an influx of calcium. And the influx of calcium allows or stimulates the vesicles within the uh, presynaptic membrane to bind with the presynaptic membrane and be released into the synaptic cleft, which um, allows the neurotransmitter to travel across the synaptic cleft and bind with the receptor on the other side to allow you know, further transmission of the action potential across the synaptic cleft. So if we have too much, if we have an imbalance of potassium, it is going to have a significant in effect on, on the nervous system. Um, second, it's going to have a significant effect on muscles and that is because of the critical role that calcium plays in forming tropomyosin cross bridges. So in order for troponin and myosin to um, bind with each other, um, we need to have a, um, a perfect balance of potassium. Uh, because they are critical in the role of forming tropo tropomyosin uh, cross bridges to allow muscles to contract effectively and then to uncontract when they're done. And then the third area is in the myocytes in the heart. Um, calcium plays a critical role in maintaining the uh, prolonged action potential that we see that is sort of characteristic of myocardiocytes because of the sustained action potential from that are allowed because of the slow 
calcium channels. Okay, so these are sort of the three main areas that we see effects from um, hypercalcemia. From the effects on the nervous system, we see, you know, initially we will see uh, anxiety and depression and rarely, um, you know, we can, we'll see cognitive changes, mental status changes, and this can pro progress to lethargy and coma when calcium levels get greater than about 14 milligrams per deciliter. Now with muscles it's possible that you can see um, skeletal muscle weakness although it's a relatively rare finding but what we do see is effects on smooth muscle and in particular we end up with cramping, um, nausea, vomiting, and anorexia of the gut and um, the main theory behind this is that that, ha that most of this has to do with um, both the um, problems with smooth muscle in the gut and also problems from the nervous system, uh, the autonomic nervous system communicating with the gut um, as well. So we get end up with GI symptoms related to both the nervous system controlling the gut and the smooth muscles of the gut. And then um, we can end up with some tachyarrhythmias, sinus arrhythmias, and ventricular arrhythmias um, when calcium levels um, get very high, and again, usually greater than 14 or so before we start seeing the serious problems with arrhythmias. Okay, so those are the signs and symptoms to look out for. If you have mental status changes, um, if you have a patient that's complaining of cramping, nausea, vomiting, um, or anorexia, and if you're seeing um, rhythm disturbances in the heart, think about checking a calcium level. Now, if it's elevated, the treatment, the simplest um, acute treatment is to give fluid and Lasix because this will cause a calciuresis along with other electrolytes um, we will spill um, calcium. Um, the mainstay of treatment obviously is to treat the underlying disease so to treat the tumor you know the cancer um, with chemotherapy radiation um, etc. And then um, if, if there is a severe acute condition that isn't responding to Lasix um, or you have very, very high calcium levels, uh, you can consider giving bisphosphonates plus minus calcitonin. Okay, so those are the um, sort of mainstays of treatment. I would think first about Lasix and fluid. Um, if the calcium level is very high or they're not responding to Lasix and fluid, consider giving um, bisphosphonates and or um, calcitonin and then obviously you're going to want to be thinking about treating the uh, the underlying cancer okay so that's all I have for you for uh, for hypercalcemia and cancer and I will see you in my next video